you coined the term white fragility. And it ha what's interesting is it has caused a lot of controversy, at least among my white UU friends. So I'd love to, for you to speak on how you came to coin that term. It's kind of classic, right? Like I, I've had people tell me, well, the term itself is, is offensive, and, and, uh, which is perfect. It's classic white fragility, right? I, to name whiteness, right, is really problematic for a lot of people. Um, how I came to coin it was I have a really rare job, right? Day in and day out, I uh, hold sustained conversations on race and racism with primarily white audiences. The reason my audiences are primarily white is because I'm in the workplace and most of the people in those positions are white, right? Um, and in doing that, there were really consistent patterns of engagement. It was almost as if we'd been handed a script, right? And it was so predictable, these reactions. And as I thought about them, they, they basically looked like fragility to me, the inability to handle uh, any challenge to our positions, our worldview, the entitlement to not have those positions named, right? The entitlement to be seen as, a, I would say, slash demand to be seen as an individual outside of race. And when I, when I use the term fragility, it doesn't mean weak. Right? It really, really, what it means is I can't handle that and I will do whatever it takes for you to stop that. And if that means I need to come across as weak, I'll come across as weak. So I'll cry. Um, uh, if it means I need to kind of storm out or get angry and get my back up, I'll do that. And I, it's not necessarily I'm consciously thinking I'm going to block, but um, for many factors that I'm sure will emerge as we discuss this deeper, um, that that reflex of oh I've got to I've got to stop that challenge because it's throwing me off of my racial equilibrium, and racial equilibrium for white folks is again comfort around the racial status quo the default, um, and that is uncomfortable so something must be wrong, uh, coupled with you know. Um, this false idea that to be complicit with racism would make us bad people. You know, there are many threads that lead to this response. So, yeah, I, I felt the need to just name it and identify it and make it clear. And that's one of the things that's important to me in my work, right? I am an academic and I can write in that really, really high level academic speak that you can barely understand. Um, but I, I'm also an educator and I like to take everyday familiar narratives and responses and then just make it clear how is this actually functioning in terms of addressing racial inequity. Abby, can you give examples of white fragility for those who may not be clear on what we're talking about? Sure. Um, it would be, um, okay, so the classic example is if you, if you have a dominant understanding of racism, right? The, the dominant framework for racism is that it's an either-or proposition, right? That some people are racist and some people are not. And those that are, are, that are, are, are bad people. They're immoral. That's the first thing. The second thing is that racists know they're racist. They actually are openly aware to themselves that they don't like people of color. Um, and so when you give well, that's the dominant frame, right? An anti-racist frame is there's no way any of us could avoid internalizing the, the messages of, and I'm going to use the term, you know, <laughs> I risk right now triggering white fragility in your audience, um, but white supremacy. We live in and swim in the water of white supremacy, and by that I mean white as central, central as superior, um, and so it is inevitable that I have unaware investments and frameworks and um, that I'm coming from that place, right? So now you try to give me some feedback about how I just in that moment, right, reinforce that. Um, and I respond very poorly. Uh, so the first thing I would ask your audience is, even if they're primarily white, is have you ever noticed any defensiveness on this topic from white people? Right? And, you know, even white people laugh at that. Yeah, we know we're really defensive. Um, and I'll often ask people of color, have you ever tried to give white people feedback on our inevitable, but often unaware racism, and had that go well for you? Right? They laugh, right? I look at, look at Asia. <laughs> um, 
So it's that. It's that. It's those. Why, why are we so defensive? Why doesn't it go well? Um, because we hear a moral a slight, right? To we we sincerely believe it wouldn't be possible for us to be racist because we're good people, and so we. We get very upset and defensive, and we cry, and we get our feelings heard, and we suggest that you you don't know us, and you're generalizing, and you're just trying to make us feel bad. You've heard all of this, right? I, I think that's what's resonated so much for people is that it's so familiar. I actually think progressive white folks like me uh, are the hardest to the degree that we think we're we're down, we're good to go, we've got friends of color, we we're gonna put all our energy into deflecting rather than the ongoing lifelong reflecting that this requires, right? You're never finished. Um, and it comes out in such um, well you know, I'm I'm pausing because from my white point of view, subtle and maybe more or less subtle to people of color, but um, it comes out of us in really different kinds of ways. But they're very pernicious, and they they create a kind of toxic environment. Um, and so that's another real challenge of this work is getting white progressives to to reach for humility on this topic. I have never met a white person without an opinion on racism. Has anybody here ever met anybody? Okay. Um, and yet, uh, sincerely, if you haven't devoted years of sustained study and focus, yeah, you have an opinion. It's misinformed. It's superficial. It's limited. Um, it, it couldn't be anything other than that because it's so complex and nuanced, and nothing gives us the information we need. You can get a PhD. You can lead a university system without having any skills uh, uh, to engage in this this um, arguably most complex and nuanced uh, social dynamic since the founding of our country, right? I'm really curious, Robin, um, uh, when, when you're doing these trainings and you've had the benefit of all this repetition to see the patterns, <laughs> are there, are there um, responses that you see when people, when white people get challenged on their on their white supremacy, uh, that you know are not white fragility, and how do you tell the difference? And does it ever happen? What does it look like? Essentially, it looks like receiving the feedback with grace, uh, appreciating the feedback because you you sincerely want to identify your patterns and investments, um, reflecting on the feedback and seeking to change your behavior checking in with the folks who gave you the feedback, being accountable. It's actually fairly simple. If you have fundamentally integrated an understanding that it's not about being good or bad, right? That it is inevitable and so you... Can you imagine how this would shift if we actually wanted to see our racism so we could stop it? So we could knock it off? Um, but very few people respond in a way that would <laughs> convey that they actually care to know 